Welcome. Today is our last day discussing different ethical theories. We're going to revisit the notion of choices through atheist existentialist Sastra and also through the virtue ethics as applied by Aristotle. When thinking about moral theories again, we need to revisit the concepts presented by Aquinas and in part to Augustine. The idea is that we really want what are goods that are connected with us. And ultimately, for these two, that was God. And the idea of a beatific perfection that we could see and anticipate going to in the hereafter. We want to fill our souls by being in communion with God and receiving the benefits of that relationship. If, therefore, we speak of man's last end as things which is this end, thus all other things concur in man's last end, since God is the last end of man and of all other things, according to Aquinas. As such, we choose, and all of our choices, are supposed to help us aid in this journey. This is why Aquinas said, quote, just as the natural appetite tends towards good existing in a thing, so the animal or voluntary appetite tends to a good which is apprehended. Consequently, in order that will tend towards anything, it is requisite, not that it be good in the very truth, but that be apprehended as good. Here, this notion of apprehension was key to notions of people's philosophy like Bonaventure and others, but this is about our choices. Not necessarily that we're always choosing the good, but that what we're choosing, we apprehend as good. We anticipate it as good, and this is why we choose it. Aquinas here is following the logic of Augustine, who in turn was following the ideas presented by Plato and other non-Platonic and Neoplatonic schools. The idea here for the Neoplatonists is that everything proceeds from the center, from this one. And from here, we end up getting different spheres of thought and eventually to where we are connected to it. So perfection is found largely in the one. This is an overgeneralization, but we can kind of see it for our argument. The good that we're anticipating are those ideas that are closer to the ideal. Here, we're going to see this in sort of the universal realm of ideas before we have them here. So properly speaking, evil is the privation of good. Evil is not a thing, it's just farther away from perfection. And in fact, all of our choices are trying to get as close to the perfect as possible. Things are bad in what they are when they are further away from this goodness that we truly seek, but they're not bad because they have no value whatsoever. We need to keep this in mind when judging theories and practices of others that sometimes they choose something not because they're bad or they're evil or they're stupid, but because they're choosing different goods. They think different goods are closer to the notion of perfection than others. So if egoism is correct and that it is all about what you want, the question then becomes, what do you want? Do you want to be selfish? Do you want to be seen as selfish or not? Um, what goods are you seeking? What is it in your own life that you think is a good thing for you to have? I'll give you a minute to think about them, right? List off three or four different things that you think are goods in this life. You know, you might be thinking of things like wealth, uh, comfort, food, physical pleasure, emotional pleasure, stability, uh, relationships might be something else that you're all saying. All right, so all of these things we're wanting, uh, and the egoist is, is kind of saying, well, then you're going to seek them out. Aristotle, too, asks, what is it that you're seeking? Uh, what is the thing that all of actions that you're doing in your life are being for? Uh, and, and therefore, what is important is not just what those actions are, but also the means in which you're going to do to get them. This becomes the heart of the issue of virtue ethics. Uh, right? So if you're wanting something, what's going to help you do that? Uh, so he's asking us to look once again at, at the goods in which we are seeking. 
uh, and really wants to see that there's sometimes we're doing one thing, not just for that sake, but for something else. Why is it we have certain actions that we're doing? He points out that the point of medicine isn't just to prop up the medical industry, uh, but it's for health, right? This is the reason why we care about medicine, uh, that you know, there's strategy in trying to achieve a certain end and a certain goal uh, involved in, in tactics or gameplay or anything else to that effect. Um, you know, the, the point of architecture is that eventually you have a building, uh, that there's an, a means and an end, that these are not things that are ends in themselves, but they are means from one to another. So he's going to ask us, you know, what is the goods that we're really seeking? What is the thing that all other actions are being done for? And that this is what we should be looking for. Not just things like wealth and comfort and food and pleasure, but are these things done for some other good? It, what is the end uh, to this effect? So really the, the issue for Aristotle is that we want to look at and try to find the answer of one final end. Right? What is the thing that we're really wanting? Looking over your own list of things that you say that you want. Yeah, Aristotle states, the argument has by different course reached to the same point, but we must try to state it even more clearly. Since there are evidently more than one end and we choose some of these for the sake of something else, clearly not all ends are final ends, but the chief good is evidently something final, right? The good that we would all say is really important is something that we would say is a final end. Uh, and he says, if there is only one end, that this is truly what we're seeking, that this is what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to find this big end, the big answer uh, to why we are doing certain actions. So Aristotle wants us to ask, why is it we're doing different things? Ask yourself, think about, what did you have for lunch yesterday? Uh, why are you in this class? Why did you pick out that shirt? Right, these are all basic sort of things that you all have an answer for. But Aristotle doesn't want to just say, what did you have for lunch yesterday? But why did you have that for lunch yesterday? Why are you in this class? Uh, why did you pick out that shirt? Why is it that the answer to those questions uh, exists? Right? You picked out that shirt because it's clean. Why is it you think that it's important to have a clean shirt? Uh, why is it that it's because you want to be presentable, because you care about your appearance? Why? Uh, why is the end to that? Right? Why are you in this class? Undoubtedly, you're in this class because it's a requirement uh, that you, you want to take this class uh, so that way you can get a degree. Well, why do you want to get a degree? Uh, what point is there to that? Okay, so you can have a good job. Why is it that you want to have a good paying job? Uh, why is it you're wanting security in that? You know, why is it you ate what you ate for lunch yesterday? Why, why, why becomes the sort of questions that we're going to face over and over again. And the answer is eventually for Aristotle, when there is a why, that the answer is simply just because, because this is a good thing in itself. That this, this thing, is what we're seeking after. All of those other things are what's known as proximate ends. They're not final ends. They're all ends. They're all means to achieving something that you truly want. What we really want is security at the end of the, the class or, or respect or, or something else to these effects, that they're bigger issues. It's not simply because it looked nice. Uh, it's because it has something to do with a real end that you're going to want. For Aristotle, the main thing that we're all seeking after is this term eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is often translated as happiness, but it's better to be translated as flourishing. Right? This is what we really want. You want to flourish. You want your life to go well. Now, what does it mean to have a life that goes well? That's been part of the whole conversation the entire semester. Uh, and you can look back at many of the other discussions we've had and see ties in with Aristotle. But the idea is that you want to flourish. You want your life to go exceedingly well. So how is it you do that? 
right? It's not just by picking out the right shirt or having the right thing for lunch or taking the right class, uh, but we want to have a flourishing life. Aristotle needs to point out that it's not just flourishing in a moment, that we're going to add in that this must be done in a complete life. Because there's a lot of things that you can do that right now would be good, but you know would be horrible, uh, right? There's a lot of things that, you know, in the short term, the amount of pleasure you'd get out of it or the satisfaction out of a relationship uh, or something else that you might gain in the moment uh, could be fantastic, but you know it's going to bring you ultimate ruin. And so most of you make the prudent choice to not do that. So we want to make sure that whatever actions we do, uh, that we're wanting to flourish in a complete life, uh, assuming that your, your life can go on and do this. It says, therefore, since we're wanting a complete life to be flourishing, not just momentary happiness, then this is going to bring us to really kind of the heart of the matter for Aristotle. Uh, and this is the idea that we must be virtuous. Right. Virtue is what's going to help bring about the most happy life. Again, many of us have seen that we can have momentary uh, issues that don't do us well. Uh, and that usually those are the things that we would say are not virtuous acts. Very rarely, seldom to never, uh, right, is the idea that you've done something virtuous and ultimately at the end of your life, you're going to look back at it with regret uh, and remorse, uh, right? That, that anything virtuous at the end, you're, you're going to be happy. You're going to be satisfied that you did that, even if it did bring about ruin, right? Because ultimately, by making sure that you were virtuous, you get to flourish. And this is what Aristotle and virtue ethics is really pointing at of what we're wanting to do. So how is it that we become virtuous? That's a great question. Uh, this is the question that obviously needs to come out next, right? We want to be virtuous, then how? Since we want to be virtuous, Aristotle points out that there's two different types of virtue. There's intellectual virtue and moral virtue. Intellectual virtue, uh, in the main, he says, owes both to birth uh, and growth to teaching. Most of us would probably say more the latter than the former, but again, Aristotle, this is his argument. Um, and he's going to say that most of it's going to be developed in our eyes through teachings. What, what are you going to hear and learn uh, through that's intellectually virtuous? It's going to help your intellect. Moral virtue, he says, comes about as a result of habit. Uh, and therefore, the, the term ethic is one that's really kind of very close to ethos, uh, right? The habit that's going to be done through your actions uh, it becomes the ethical thing to do. He also wants to say that it's plain that none of the moral virtues arise in us by nature, for nothing that exists by nature can uh, form a habit contrary to its nature. Uh, this is, again, something we can argue with Aristotle or not. But the idea that habit uh, is really how we're going to develop virtues. Right? What are the habits in your life? What are the things that you're doing over and over and over again? Uh, that habits end up helping build on themselves. You want to be virtuous. Uh, the idea is that you need to start doing virtuous things. Uh, we almost have the idea that we can fake it until we make it for Aristotle, right? That if you're going to do something over and over and over again, even if your heart's not in it, uh, you're going to act virtuous. Uh, in fact, Aristotle even says that. Uh, look at somebody who's uh, virtuous and, and copy them. Do what they say. Do what they do. Uh, and again, the idea is, even if it's not something that is inherent in you, this is how you're going to learn and develop to do it. You're going to have these actions, the power of habit, go over and over and over again, right? You all know that breaking a bad habit is very, very hard. You habitually want to go back and do that same thing again and again and again, because this is what you do, right? You, you always do this bad habit in this time of day with these people in this area. Uh, and how do you end that? Well, you have to end being with those people at that time uh, or, do, or be in a different place. 
Same thing with good habits, right? They take a long time to form. Uh, but even a good habit, if you stop doing it for a little while, feels weird, right? When you're on vacation and you don't get to do some of your good regular habits, you feel that something is missing. Uh, and so the idea is virtue is something you develop as a habit. Uh, that habits themselves have a great power. And so make sure you spend your time developing good habits and avoiding bad habits. The question may be asked, which habits should I follow? Which ones are good to create? Which ones are good to avoid? Um, and, and how do you find the right ones to do? And, and what ends up developing from Aristotle is what becomes known as the doctrine of the golden mean. When addressing the doctrine of the golden mean, we need to find the right point between vices. This is virtue. He's going to say in, in most actions, in most thoughts, in most what you're going to do, uh, if you are to have too little of something or too much of something, that would we would decide as a vice. And the virtue is finding the right amount of that. Right? He's going to say that in exercise that we have to lift the right amount of weight. And if you're bench pressing, you normally bench press 150 pounds. Uh, if I throw on 300 pounds and expect you to do that, you're going to fail, right? It, the weight is an twice, right, uh, excessive of what you're able to do. You're not going to be healthy. You're going to injure yourself. Similarly, if I only give you 10 pounds and expect you to do that, um, you're really not going to get a workout. Right, your your body is is not going to be making any more muscle, right? It's really not going to do you any good. Uh, and in fact, you might say, well, to try to gain any sort of weight, I'm going to have to increase my reps, and you're going to reach to a point where you might tear something just by too much repeated motion, uh, and probably, in all likelihood, losing your form, etc. Right? So you need to find that sweet spot. Maybe you can push it a little bit more one way or the other. Uh, but right, this is what you need to work on and where you need to be. The example that Aristotle specifically uses is the notion of courage. Whereas courage is to be found is in between notions of cowardice and recklessness. Right, that the same person, if you run away from what's confronting you, we're calling you a coward. Uh, if you're so fearless that you're rushing straight into a battle, he's going to say then you're just being reckless, right? You're not stopping and thinking uh, that you have to respect what you're addressing. Uh, and that becomes where courage is to be found. Uh, and so this the virtue of courage is in between these. And we have similar sort of ideas in a lot of other areas of life as well. There's many other places where we can find where virtue is found between the two vices, where the mean, the golden mean, is found between deficiency and excess. Right? We've got bravery. Uh, he's going to also talk about the notions of temperance uh, between addictive and ascetic, generous between stingy and extravagant, truthful between self-deprecating and boastful on how we're going to address ourselves. Uh, you can find lists all over the place. Uh, and you can, you know, kind of see where you are in your own life on this as well. There's a lot of things that, you know, if you do too much uh, or too little, it's going to harm you and you need to find the right sweet spot. Now, the problem with things like the golden mean is what do you do with, you know, horrible uh, things? Is it okay to do a little bit of that? Uh, is it okay to kill just a little bit uh, or take a little bit of meth? And the answer is, of course, not. Right? Doing things like that are, are just inherently bad um, and need to be avoided. Now, the idea is you find the golden mean to navigate with things around that. You're not just doing everything in a small amount and not to excess. There are some things that are once is excessive, right? Killing people is excessive done at a singular moment. Obviously, we might find exceptions to this, right? It, we're going to say it might not be excessive if it's uh, to save your own life or if you're called up to service of for war uh, or to help an innocent, possibly. Uh, although even that becomes a little iffy, uh, right? So, but otherwise, we would say it's excessive to just do it once. 
uh, theft could be a similar other things, right? We can find a lot of things that are uh, excessive to be done once. Uh, but what the golden mean does is it allows for kind of exceptions for those rules. We would say theft is generally excessive to do once. Uh, but if you're starving uh, and genuinely starving and there's bread, uh, and this is going to help you not starve, what most of us would say that it's not excessive to steal in this moment if it's a life-saving emergency. Uh, that, right, there, there, where excess is found is very, very, very close to zero, uh, to one, right, to, the, to doing it once. But we do have a couple of exceptions, and we would say of these people uh, that starving to death as opposed to stealing, right? That becomes the deficiency. Uh, and so again, interesting ways that we can massage this and look upon where the virtues are found. But the golden mean becomes the sort of instrument in how to do that. So we find ourselves in this tricky sort of position where the golden mean helps us understand, but we still have this idea of, well, how many times and what way and how should we do all this, right? The real question is, as Aristotle points out, how can we ever become virtuous? Uh, in this discussion, he says that you, the agent, uh, must be knowledgeable, right? We have to first have knowledge about what we're doing, and this is going to help us become virtuous, uh, that you need to know what's going on. Second, uh, you must choose the acts and choose them for their own sakes. Right, you, it becomes a little tricky when we're doing something for something else, right? If we're not looking at those final ends, if we're looking at everything as a sort of means to an end, this is becomes very tricky when talking about notions of morality. If everything is simply a means to something else, uh, that an action must be chosen for its own sake. Uh, and otherwise, understand that why you're doing this, and, and it takes on the moral character of maybe that other act. but also on its own. And this becomes a very tricky thing, right? We're not consequentialists where we're only looking at the consequences, if the consequent is good, but also why you're doing it, right? So we find ourselves in a sort of sweet spot between notions of duty uh, from the deontology perspective and notions of consequence from the consequentialist perspective, uh, that you need to have this sort of unchangeable character that's dictating what you need to do. Thirdly, uh, your actions must proceed from a firm and unchangeable character, right? Your character has to will for a good thing and choose the good thing along these ways. This becomes the virtue. Now, again, this, this becomes really tricky. Uh, and Aristotle kind of expands upon this a little bit. And he says, actions then are called just and temperate when they are such as the just or temperate man would do. But it is not the man who does these that is just and temperate, but the man who also does them as a just and temperate man do them, right? So it's not just that you're doing the right things, but you also have to do them as the right things. Um, and again, this goes back to what Aristotle is going to say. It's about habit. Uh, it's about forming your actions like the person who you want would do them, not just how you want to do them or just the consequences. There is this sort of mirroring uh, and virtues are found by comparison with others on where do we see these lines and how do we want to do that. But this becomes the idea for Aristotle on how you can become virtuous. Again, going back to these earlier discussions, look at virtuous people, do what they do, do it how they do it, do it why they do it. And this tells you what virtue also is. And you'll notice that in the majority of the time, it follows this notion of the golden mean. Uh, and that's the easy way for you to move and accept and acknowledge that as well. To begin with, existentialism has got different branches and, and they look at things differently. For our discussions, the two atheist existentialists that we're choosing to highlight are Sartre and Nietzsche. And we'll understand that while they might share this idea of being atheist existentialists, not all existentialism is the same and not all atheist existentialists will hold the same moral views either. To start with, I'm going to be so bold as to point out something that's wrong with Sartre. In many ways, this is a very bold statement for me to make because Sartre's 
generally regarded as the greatest of the French existentialists and the father of French atheistic existentialism. And for me to sit back later and say, yeah, you were wrong about this, seems a little petty and nonsensical and and really kind of problematic in all sorts of different ways. But Sartre ends up making a statement somewhat casually and somewhat very importantly in his work existentialism as a humanism that a lot of people because Sartre is an expert in this field take to just be true and yet it's not and this is a claim around the notion of one's existence preceding one's essence this is in fact a central tenet of atheistic existentialism as advocated by Sartre but this is not the case for all existentialists he ends up claiming that theistic existentialists would agree with this claim in his work and while he might find a few who would it really wouldn't be apt to say that that's an accurate statement people like kierkegaard would vigorously disagree with this and we'll kind of tease out the idea of existence and essence and, and what these mean here in a little while but this is a very important distinction to be made between atheistic existentialists like Sartre and Camus and Nietzsche and theistic existentialists on the other hand like Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky. Another subtle but key distinction between these groups is over terms which have a certain amount of overlap in their meaning but how they're applied is also very different. The notion of the absurd is really important for Camus and has its grounding in the fact that there is no God for his position. While Kierkegaard would never advocate for notions of the absurd, he does have a parallel train of thought when he addresses the paradox. And in many ways, the paradox is the absurd, but with the distinction that there is a God and an object for which faith must be done. And yet trying to think what thought itself cannot think, trying to reach beyond it yourself could be seen as an absurdity it's got fruit at the result of it for Kierkegaard and therefore it's not an absurdity but a paradox and is a driving force of his notion of theistic existentialism. So if existentialism is not what you're going to get it casually mentioned in by Sartre as your existence preceding your essence or the idea of the absurd what is it well we've, we've mentioned this a little bit before but importantly existentialism is a school of philosophical thought that emphasizes your choices and your decisions it's about what you decide to do because when you decide to do something that has everything wrapped up into it it makes you who you are and so you can't casually make a decision. All decisions will carry the weight that Kierkegaard had with breaking off his engagement with Regine Olson. That it's hard and difficult, but yet a task that needs to be done. This is the emphasis of what existentialism truly is, is it's about your choices. It's not about absurdity although your choices might be based on absurdity. It's not about a paradox, although your choices might be wrapped up in within a notion of a paradox. It does have a relation between your existence and your essence. And depending on how you're going to be presenting your notions of existentialism, these will look differently. For Sartre, the choices and decisions that you make are essential because, as we'll point out, is the key notion in his work, Existentialism as a Humanism, in fashioning myself, I fashion man. You fashion yourself. You make yourself who you are through your choices and decisions. And this is what existentialism is for Sartre, much more than the other things that kind of build off of this 
right? The whole idea of one's existence preceding your essence really is how it relates to this thesis that your decisions decide who you are. And Sartre also says that decides who everybody is. So how would I define existentialism? The best definition I can come up with is that it's a philosophical movement which emphasizes the existence of the individual, an individual who is a responsible agent, who through choices of their own determines their essence. Now, this doesn't mean that one happens to exist prior to the other. And again, depending on how we would like to address this, we would look at these ideas differently. Now, the issues that are being debated here between our theistic and atheistic counterparts are the notions of your essence and your existence. These are supposed to be one. These are supposed to be identical. Your essence is what you are, who you are as an individual. If I was to ask you who you are, you'll give me your name, maybe an occupation, maybe a couple of traits, right? Who do you think you are in yourself? This is the notion of your essence as opposed to your existence. And that is that you are, right? You exist. You breathe, you walk, you talk, you relate with other people, etc. right? However you're going to find existence, undoubtedly you would say that you exist. If you don't, then this is a whole different discussion for you, isn't it? But the fact that you believe that you exist means that you're out here amongst everything else. So the question between our different camps of existentialists is which one comes first? Your essence, or your existence, who you are, or what you do. And these, again, who you are and what you do should be the same. Your choices and decisions are to bring these things together in one form or another. So quick poll, have you ever stolen something? Yes. Have you ever lied? Maybe. Would it be accurate to say that if you steal that you are a criminal and a thief? That this is who you are? After all, what you've done is stolen. It's the act of a thief. Would it be accurate to say that if you have lied, that you are a liar? Would it be okay for somebody to characterize you as a thief and a liar? After all, if you've stolen even a little thing, even if it was a while ago, maybe you were a child, maybe it was a paperclip from work, doesn't matter, it wasn't yours. You stole it. You are a thief. If you've ever lied, no. Oh, yeah, this food is great. Oh, it's horrible, but I'm gonna say it's great. I don't wanna hurt your feelings. Or yeah, I'll call you again. Yeah, I don't ever wanna talk to you again. This was the worst date ever or whatever, right? If you've lied, even if it's for a good reason, even if you can come up with a million reasons why it's okay, you are a liar. And many of you who are listening to me engaged in this class are a bunch of liars and thieves. If you were to ask me to write you a letter of recommendation, should I state so-and-so was a general good student? It's amazing what they're able to do, seeing as they are a liar and a thief, you'd probably say, you should leave that other part out. That's not really how I see myself. You would probably say, since the majority of people do say this, no, 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 I'm a good person. Those are exceptions to who I am. They're not really who I am, that my 
existence didn't correspond with my essence. Even though what your existence has demonstrated is that you are a thief and a liar. Is there a difference depending on the action of what we would say changes somebody's essence? How about if they murdered somebody? I just casually, you know, murdered people. That doesn't mean I'm a murderer. Or would you say, nope, sorry, that's a big one. That one you, you're stuck with. Does it matter the severity of it? Or does it only mean that when you decided it was okay to lie, that you're a casual liar? That you think lying is so unimportant that it is really who you are all the more. The murderer might actually feel great and grave remorse over this action. It might be something that haunts them all the days of their life that they did this. Yet you are making excuses and ignoring the fact that you lie and steal. Maybe you don't. Maybe I'm talking to your classmates instead of you. Maybe you've been the perfect you know, paradigm of, of virtue your entire life. Congratulations, if so. But are there certain actions which change who you are in your essence? Or is it just your existence? We can very clearly see this sort of debate and discussion between our different types of existentialists on this very basic question. Are you indeed a liar and a thief? Or have you just lied and stolen? So our camps of existentialism is fairly well drawn. For the Christian existentialist, your essence precedes your existence. Who you are exists before you've done a single thing. God knows who you are. And your job through your life is to match who God knows you to be with what you do in your life. You are to live up to the virtues and character to which God envisions you to be. And your choices are difficult, but you have a calling, you have a direction, you have an identity, and you need to live up to that. And again, your choices are very important with that. For the atheist existentialist, your existence precedes your essence. There's nothing but you to tell you who you are. And the only way of telling you who you are is by what you do. So if you steal, that is who you are. If you lie, that is who you are. You know why I know that? Because you did it. And you can't appeal to some sort of secret special gnosis, some special wisdom that is going to say that you're somehow different. Because how we know who you are is based on what you've done, if you are an atheist existentialist. And we can see very clearly how the question of does your essence precede your existence or your existence precede your essence is dependent upon God. But also, when you get down to it, both of which will firmly emphasize that you need to make sure you're doing the right thing. Either because that is all that you are or you're more than that, so you better do the right thing because you're going to be held accountable for the distinction and the division between who you are and what you appear to be. Sartre lived and wrote during the glory days of existentialism. It really had its vintage years, as it were, following the Second World War. And the idea of existentialism became so ubiquitous with kind of philosophy and kind of a new post-war thought that it 
kind of lost all of its meaning. In many ways, existentialism is kind of like the term postmodern during this idea, where anyone or everyone would kind of glob onto it and assume some sort of identity, where it's became kind of a catch-all term for the sort of cultural and artistic avant-garde radical critiques of universal principles and absolute values that existed before it. And in many ways, it's accurate to characterize some of these thoughts as existentialist. In other ways, it's not. And we kind of need to push back and know where our push and pull would be. Uh, there's a problem when a term becomes so overly used that it loses its actual meaning. And so many of you might have your image of existentialism being in this period as opposed to others. Jean-Paul Sartre lived 1905 to 1980. His work as a atheist existentialist in France was during this sort of glory days where you might not even want to call yourself an existentialist because the meaning could have been all sorts of other things. His major works include Being in Nothingness and No Exit. Uh, the work we're addressing today is existentialism as a humanism, and he's got quite a few others. His main philosophy is really over that idea that being in itself, the world is everything that is given meaning or structured by being for itself in the act of consciousness. That you need to be in yourself, and this is what gives it meaning. As a free and transcending self-consciousness, being for itself is, oddly enough, also nothingness. Therefore, we have this connection between being and nothingness in his major work. He ends up developing what is known as a phenomenological ontology, centering along this reflexive analysis of consciousness, wherein consciousness of something is distinguished from the consciousness of the self that is reflexively implicit or mirrored in the consciousness of something. So your self helps you understand what that object is as it's reflecting upon yourself when you look at what other things are. It's a little confusing for some, but this is the sort of reflexive, as it said, uh ontology right that the way you understand things is also through how you look at yourself and in many ways we can see the basis of Sartre's notion of philosophy here being in relation to hegel and his master slave dialectic as well as the categories instituted by kant and really grounded in a very broad and yet also deep understanding of the philosophies that have existed prior to his writing in that post-war period. For our discussion today, the focus is on the idea of ethics as applied through his understanding of existentialism. And he's advocating for this in the work Existentialism is a Humanism. He says the purpose here, his purpose, is to offer a defense of existentialism against several reproaches that have been laid against it. Already at this period, there are those who don't like existentialism and are rejecting it and pushing back against this idea that has become so broad that it has almost lost its meaning here. See, the question is also only complicated because there are two kinds of existentialists. There are on one hand the Christian existentialists and on the other hand, atheist existentialists among whom he's going to place Heidegger, as well as the French existentialist to whom he's a representative. What they have in common is simply the fact that they believe that existence comes before essence, or if you will, that we must begin from the subjective. And what do we mean by that? Now, notice here that he's equating this essence and existence thing with that beginning of the subjective that you're going to begin with your own position. Now, if we're going to interpret his idea that the Christian existentialists will say that we need to begin with the subjective, then you're right. But if we're going to mean that who you are, what one's essence is, is only contained in the subjective, then you're wrong. 
Right? And there's there's a subtle but very important distinction between this, and, and this is why I needed to lay out that caveat on Sartre and his notion of existentialism at the very beginning. Sartre says that when we think of God as the creator, we are thinking of him most of the time as a supernatural artisan. Whatever doctrine we may be considering, whether it's a doctrine like that of Descartes or of Leibniz himself, we always imply that the will follows, more or less, from the understanding, or at least accompanies it, so that when God creates, he knows precisely what he is creating. Man possesses a human nature. That human nature, which is the conception of human beings, is found in every man, which means that each man is a particular example of a universal conception, that conception of man. We're engaged in a much wider philosophical debate here when we're thinking of God and God having ideas of people. What is it that God happens to see of humanity? What universals can be said about the particulars? If there's a God, we assume that God knows what God is doing, that it's not just an accident, but rather humanity is something known by this God. This is now challenged by atheistic existentialism. He says, of which he's a representative, declares with greater consistency that if God does not exist, there is still yet one being whose existence comes before its essence, a being which exists before it can be defined by any conception of it. But if God doesn't exist, then the idea of what human nature is does not exist in the mind of God. But yet he says that there is this being who can exist before they know what it is, whose conceptions of the nature exists ahead of time. That being is man, or as Heidegger has it, the human reality. What do we mean by saying that existence precedes essence? We mean that man, first of all, exists, encounters himself, surges up in the world, and defines himself later. You were all born. You live. You then at some point decide, I am not going to do this, that, or the other because that's not who I am. You decide this is going to be what my vocation is. I'm going to engage my life towards these pursuits. And this is going to be how I define who I am. And that this is the call of what you have to do as an existentialist. And for the atheist existentialist, this is you defining who you are. Therefore, this is also going to lead us to that first principle of existentialism. He says, if man as the existentialist sees himself is not definable, it is because, to begin with, he is nothing. How are you going to define who you are? He says, the starting point is that you are simply nothing. There's nothing there. He will not be anything until later. And then he will be what he makes of himself. You start off as nothing, a conception of other people perhaps, but nothing of your own choosing, nothing of what you really are. Later, you conceive of who you are and, and this is where you're going to be found. Sartre says, there is no human nature because there is no God to have a conception of it. Man simply is. Man is nothing else but what he makes of himself. And that is the first principle of existentialism. You simply are. You are what you will yourself to be. You are your choices and your decisions. You are what you do. It is up to you to decide all of these things. This is that first principle of existentialism. 
this naturally leads us to the first effect of existentialism. He says, before that projection of the self, nothing exists. Right? Before you assert who you are, you are nothing because you haven't decided what you are yet. Not even in the heaven of intelligence, man will only attain existence when he is what he purposes to be. Not, however, what he may wish to be. Right? You are not just simply what you hope to be. But again, this is where your decisions actually matter. For what we usually understand by wishing or willing, he says, is a conscious decision taken much more often than not after we have made ourselves what we are. Thus, the first effect of existentialism is that it puts every man in possession of himself as he is. What have you done? What are you? You are in possession of this, exactly what you are. And it places the entire responsibility for his existence squarely upon his own shoulders. You are responsible for all of your existence. Now, maybe you've been treated bad. Maybe you've been marginalized. Maybe you had a bad upbringing. Maybe you've got jerks all around you. Who knows? That doesn't matter. You are still responsible for you. It doesn't matter the effects and the decisions of other people. It doesn't matter if the whole system is rigged against you and that you are the most victimized, pitied, whatever. If you have no power, that doesn't matter. You still have power on you, according to Sartre here. This is the effect of existentialism. Now, the difficult thing moves forward here. He says that when we say that man is responsible for himself, we do not mean that he is responsible only for his own individuality, but that he is responsible for all men. This is the difficulty. Not only are you responsible for you, and you can't say, well, that guy over there is responsible for me. I had bad parents, I had bad society, I had bad whatever, right? No, no, you're still responsible for you. But then you're also then, according to Sartre, responsible for them, for all people, for all mankind. When we say that man chooses himself, he says we do not mean that every one of us must choose himself. But by that we also mean that in choosing himself, he chooses for all men. You choose for all men, for all people, what it is that you are. To choose between this or that is at the same time to affirm the value of that which is chosen, for we are unable ever to choose the worse. Now, this is something we might disagree with. Uh, and in many ways, he's got a differing view here of what Aquinas lays out as the idea that we always choose goods. Sartre is taking this a couple of steps farther and saying that you're incapable of choosing the worse. What we choose is always the better, and nothing can be better for us unless it is better for all. You've decided this is what is best for all. If, moreover, existence precedes essence, and we will to exist at that same time as we fashion our image. The image is valid for all and for the entire epoch in which we find ourselves. Our responsibility is thus much greater than we had supposed, for it concerns mankind as a whole. In fashioning myself, I fashion man. When you decide who you are, you decide for everybody. You decide that this is what humanity is, because humanity exists only in your mind, only in your conception of it. And your conception of that is based on your conception of yourself, right? Once again, we return to that phenomenological ontology, right? This reflexive analysis of consciousness where your consciousness of something is distinguished from the self-consciousness that is reflexively implicit or mirrored in this consciousness of this something. Your consciousness of what it is to be 
a human is reflexive not just upon what you see in other humans but primarily in your self-consciousness therefore your deciding to do something decides that this is the case for all of humanity now if you take this seriously that you then decide what all of humanity is this should cause you great anguish this is not going to be a easy thing to assume and or to assert this is going to cause you problems in every decision that you make Sartre says that the existentialist frankly states that man is in anguish his meaning is as follows when a man commits himself to anything fully realizing that he is not only choosing what he will be but is thereby at the same time a legislator deciding for the whole of mankind in such a moment a man cannot escape from the sense of complete and profound responsibility you have this great giant weight on every decision you make of course he says this is the anguish that kierkegaard calls the anguish of abraham right when kierkegaard spoke of abraham having to make the decision about what to do regarding his son and the binding of isaac and that whole story kierkegaard talks about the anguish that would have existed and the difficulty that exists for abraham to be able to engage in this unthinkable act and yet he must act this is the sort of anguish you should have over every decision that you make satra then says who then can prove that i am the proper person to impose by my own choice my conception of man upon mankind i shall never find any proof whatever there will be no sign to convince me of it if a voice speaks to me it is still myself who must decide whether the voice is or is not that of an angel who are you to decide for everybody but yet you are exactly the person who is deciding this all leaders Sartre says know that anguish it does not prevent their acting on the contrary it is the very condition of their action for the action presupposes that there is a plurality of possibilities and in choosing one of these they realize that it has value only because it is chosen there's a finite but large number of possibilities that exist for every moment your act of choosing it is what gives it value and it also is what causes you anguish now it is anguish of that kind which existentialism describes and moreover as we shall see makes explicit through direct responsibility towards other men who are concerned far from being a screen which could separate us from action it is a condition of action itself Dostoevsky famously once wrote if God did not exist everything would be permitted and that for existentialism is the starting point this is the beginning for atheist existentialism that everything indeed is permitted if God does not exist and man is in the consequence forlorn for he cannot find anything to depend upon either within or outside of himself he discovers forthwith that he is without excuse for if indeed existence precedes essence one will never be able to explain one's action by reference to a given specific human nature there is no determinism you can't say i only did this because of the human condition no your choice decided it your choice decided what was human nature man is free man is freedom you are completely free to do anything and that should terrify you according to satra right there is no god to say no you have this 
this nature, this responsibility. You have it all. Sartre continues that if God does not exist, are we provided with any values or commands that could legitimize our behavior? Thus we have neither behind us nor before us in a luminous realm of values, any means of justification or excuse. We are left alone without excuse. That is what I mean when I say that man is condemned to be free. You are alone. You must decide everything. You are responsible for you and for everyone else with no guideposts other than yourself to tell you what is the correct action. This, of course, is the very heart and center of existentialism. It is the absolute character of the free commitment by which every man realizes himself in realizing a type of humanity, a commitment always understandable to no matter whom and no matter what epoch, you are responsible. And this is where you're realizing yourself and all of humanity. It is bearing upon the relativity of the cultural pattern which may result from such an absolute commitment. One must observe equally the relativity of Cartesianism and the absolute character of the Cartesian commitment. In this sense, you may say, if you like, that one, every one of us makes the absolute by breathing, by eating, by sleeping, or by behaving in any fashion whatsoever. You become the absolute. Right? This is the character. Your choices then dictate what things are going to be. This is a doctrine of action. It's not just speculation, but you must do something as a result of it. Sartre states that existentialism is nothing else but an attempt to draw the full conclusions from a consistently atheistic position. Its intention is not in the least that of plunging men into despair, as many kind of lampoon existentialism as, especially the defense that Sartre is trying to address here. And if by despair, one only means as the Christians do, any attitude of unbelief, the despair of existentialists is, of course, something entirely different. Existentialism is not atheist in the sense that it would exhaust itself in the demonstrations of the non-existence of God. It declares rather that even if God existed, that would make no difference from its point of view. Not that we believe God does exist, but we think that the real problem is not of that of God's existence. What man needs is to find himself again and to understand that nothing can save him from himself, not even a valid proof for the existence of God. In this sense, existentialism is optimistic. It is a doctrine of action. And it is only by self-deception by confining your own despair with ours, he says, that Christians could describe us as without hope. You must still make these decisions even if God does exist, Sartre says. Even if there is a God, you still need to understand your weight and obligations towards everybody else by every decision that you make. So what does this all mean? This could be rather confusing in many ways, but we can boil it down to a couple of essential ideas. Ethically, Satra is calling you to decide, not just for yourself what actions are okay, but what is okay for humanity. There are no absolutes, and there is no outside force following Satra's atheistic existentialism to dictate morality, dictate what you do. And yet every action you do carries moral weight because it's the action of all of humanity. There's not even the use of reason to guide us to these virtues that we are determined to do, nor a code following Kant. At least this is what Sartre is arguing. We are not obliged to look 
for the happiness of others, but every action we choose is also for everybody. Even the small decisions that you make are really big because they are for everybody. Do you like chocolate or vanilla ice cream? Or are you going to be a, a radical and go with strawberry, right? Very small decision. But yet you're saying in your decision that humanity is such that prefers vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, or another flavor. You're deciding this for everybody, not just for you right now. Do you stay faithful in a relationship? This isn't just, oh, I kind of like this one or I kind of don't like that one. But you're saying that humanity is such that decides that faithfulness is a value or it's not. This is your decision to make and nobody else's. Do you kill somebody? Most of you would probably say no to this one reflexively, but you're saying that humanity is such that does not permit death, that values life, or that doesn't value life and does get to kill others. Do you ditch class? It's nice weather. Friends are inviting you to something. You're just tired. You were up too late doing something for another class. Whatever the reasons would be, it really doesn't matter. You are, by deciding to not show up, saying that you do not value this class, this education, this whatever it is that's going to be embodied there. You're deciding that nobody should show up if you don't show up. Because you are humanity. There is no, quote, humanity that exists except for within you. So this is the weight and the decision that you have to make. Every decision you have has this weight upon it. So what does this all mean? We see here with both Satra and with Nietzsche being atheist existentialists. Earlier on, Nietzsche made the argument that I am morality itself and nothing outside of me is moral. Within Satra, we see that in fashioning myself, I fashion mankind. It's possible that both of them could be true, but we see that for one, we have the leaning towards egoism and the other towards at least a larger collective good. Nietzsche didn't really care about how his ideas impacted anybody else. Most people were not capable of living up to it. And for Satra, every choice we make has dread, mystery, and misery, and anguish. We are condemned in being free. Now, again, both of them, it's about the choices. Both of them are existentialists. Both of them, there's not a God to help you with. This. They are not like Dostoevsky or Kierkegaard, where they're able to lean back on a conception of God and say that God knows what's best for you. And yet the choices then become the only thing you can have going forward. So here we are looking at ethical theories. We have to kind of look and revisit some stuff. First of all, are there any absolutes concerning morality? Is Lewis right that there is an absolute standard? Was Sumner right that it's about the patterns of a culture? That it's all relative, but in the ancestors, in what has been done, that is what's decided, what is moral? Or are we closer to Nietzsche that there is no morality outside of yourself? And what does that mean if that's the case? Is what's moral based upon the consequences? Is consequentialism the basis of morality? If something results in something that's good and makes people happy, does that automatically make it right? Or can a lot of people be happy with doing the wrong thing? Is it about, if it's about consequences too, can I just do what I want? Can I be an egoist? Is it the only person's consequence is mine and the rest of everyone else's are irrelevant? Or is it about everybody and I have to sacrifice my own good and what I want because it'll make more people happy? 
Or do we reject the idea that it's about the consequences and find the basis of morality in something else? Maybe it's virtue ethics, as talked about by Aristotle. Maybe it's about a duty that we owe maybe to ourselves, maybe to others, as talked about with Kant. Maybe there's a combination for all of these. Maybe when we're actually looking at ethics, it's not as simple and cut and dry as yes, no, check this box, this person has it all right. Maybe it's about the choices that we make and knowing the why behind our choices. And our why might not be as simple consequentialism, deontological, virtue ethics, normative ethics breakdown. And we might say there are moral absolutes and no, it's not based on just culture, Maybe it's based on something bigger and larger, but we might not know why it seems to look one way in one case and another way in another case, but we know that it's right and we know that it's universally right, or at least we anticipate that it is. And if wrong, hopefully we have the courage like Socrates to want to be shown where we're wrong so we can change our opinion and learn and grow as human beings. So this will conclude our discussion of ethical theories. In the rest of this course, we're going to apply these. We're going to look at different major questions that envelop the world around us and try to find a way to navigate what is right and how we should proceed. Thank you.